Great. Well, we are so excited for today's session. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the lovely presentation that we put together today. Um, and Steve and I have been planning this for, I don't know, maybe six months. So it's been a long time coming and we're very excited um, to welcome you to building a food brand, how to grow your business by delivering the right message to the right customer. And I'll start out with some introductions. I am Becca Brown and I'm the founder and CEO of Uppercase Industries, which is a boutique consumer insights and marketing strategy company. And at Uppercase, what we do is help clients to cultivate an intimate knowledge of their customers in a short amount of time and then use what we learn to craft strategies that really work. And we're really driven by a genuine curiosity and appreciation for humankind. Um, I'm also a Vermonter, obsessive cook and gardener, and mom of two very charming kids and one very large dog that you can see here. This is Lola. She's the queen. Um, and Steve, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. I'm so excited to be here together. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Becca. I appreciate it. So I'm Steve Redman, and I'm the owner of Rival Brands. Uh, Rival Brands is a graphic design brand strategy studio. Um, I work for myself, so I function in a lot of different capacities from designer all the way up to creative director and brand strategist. Uh, I've lived in Vermont almost my entire life. Uh, Rival Brands uh, has been focusing on the food and beverage sector uh, ever since its inception in 2016. And we work with businesses of kind of any variety of scales from startup and, uh, and growth phases to uh, legacy brands. And uh, I live in Heinsburg with my wife, Jessica, our two sons, Charlie and Teddy and our COVID dog, Molly, who's always got the best smile on her face. And I love to eat, I'm part Italian. And so food is just in my blood. Awesome, thank you. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, I wanna encourage everyone to really take a second to tune in. This is, uh, we want this to be a dynamic session. So we're encouraging everybody to be vocal in the chat and uh, you know close your tabs grab a pen and pencil to take some notes although there will be a recording so don't feel like you have to furiously take notes um we'll be asking you a few questions as we go along i always like to also say that this is a safe anti-racist space and everyone is welcome here we have a zero tolerance policy for any negative speech or comments um, at the hosts or to our guests and you'll be booted out if that happens. So I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and as a fun bonus, um, we encourage everyone to screenshot one of your favorite slides and share it to help spread the word. You can tag um, Rival Brands and myself on Instagram if you feel like it. And um, I also wanna introduce my colleague, Dave, who is right on time here in the chat. Thank you, Dave. Um, he works with me at Uppercase Industries and you'll see Dave Openquist sharing some links throughout our presentation. So just to give you a little bit um, of an idea of what we're gonna cover. And first I'm gonna ask everyone to um, introduce yourself and we'd love to hear from all our participants in the chat uh, where you're logging in from, anything you're hoping to learn, what your business is, and also please share your contact, your website or your social media handle if you like. Um, I always say that don't under, I always say, tell people not to underestimate the power of networking on um, in the chat room of webinars and workshops. I've seen folks make some great connections and, and find some cool partnerships. So go ahead to uh, and drop those in. Don't be shy. I see a lot of folks that I know. John Levy, introduce yourself. Sass, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm calling on people. <laughs> and uh, we'll take a look at that as it comes in. So Erin, thank you. Erin is from Momo's and she's around the corner. Uh, we also have Emily, who is also a good friend and she's a personal chef, highly recommend. I've used her services before. Um, awesome, smart girl strategy. We have Lee. Hi, Lee. 
many more. So keep an eye on that. I'm going to keep us going here. Um, sharing a little bit about what we're going to cover today, we'll talk through our um, easy to use brand strategy framework. Steve will cover that and how to dive deeper into that framework, along with a case study uh, on Blake Hill Preserves. I'm going to be taking you through three ways to really create a customer driven brand strategy, as well as a few insights case studies. And then we'll give you a little bit of a rundown on what it's like to work with us and then we'll do the Q&A and we have some fun questions all teed up already. Great, great to see everyone here. SAS from Adventure Dinner. We are so lucky to have so many cool companies all around us in Vermont and in the world. So uh, we have Rory from far away in California. Welcome Rory, awesome. Oh, and little Sue. Hi, Kelly. I love little Sue. It's so fun. If anyone has kids who like to cook or you want your kids to like to cook, definitely check that out. I'm a fan. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of what you'll learn by the end or our goals for you today, we are going to teach you how brand strategy can help you think like a brand and kind of train your brain to be on the lookout for everything you need to know the main parts and pieces of the puzzle to a brand strategy and how they work together to form the big picture, how brand strategy can elevate your brand and its messaging, um, what we think is unique and special about the food industry in particular and how it relates to consumer insights, some research tactics that work uh, best depending on the stage your business is at, and how you can start implementing a customer driven strategy with what you learn today. So Steve, I'm gonna hand it over to you to cover brand strategy framework to formal. Okay, all right. Well, I guess the first thing to sort of understand about what I'm gonna dive into is the reason why I'm calling it framework to formal is because um, I firmly believe that a lot of the information that I'll be talking about today and Beck as well, um, it's great for founders and marketers to know this themselves. You know, it's along the lines of the teach a person to fish and they fish forever kind of mentality. So I'm going to take you through sort of a very sort of top level brand strategy framework. And then as I go through, I'm going to get a little bit more granular. So you can kind of figure out where you fit in, in terms of your level of understanding. Um, so that's why it's sort of framed this way, going from broad to a more formal representation. Go ahead, next screen. All right, so the first thing I wanted to do is because I've learned, and sometimes people in my industry are the culprits of this, <laughs> uh, just the term brand alone can generate a lot of confusion about what exactly it is. Um, the, the phrase, a logo is not a brand, is everywhere and anywhere that you look. So uh, there's still sometimes some top level misunderstanding about what brand is. So it only stands to reason that maybe there's some uh, confusion about what we, what we mean by brand strategy. So. Uh, in, the, in this context, uh, I view brand strategy as really nothing more than a plan, just like a, a business plan is a way to kind of dictate how your business will thrive and grow with a little bit of a lean on the finances. A brand strategy is a plan for how you will fit into the marketplace with an emphasis of you as a brand and a business and how you'll function and be successful in the market. So the four really key tenants of a brand strategy and fitting into the marketplace are, as I've noted here, um, as a working on a brand strategy, we want to discover and define who you are. And that can mean anything from your purpose, like why you do what you do beyond the idea of making money. Uh, it can be discovering your values, how you'll go about acting in the marketplace and as a brand, what values drive your behavior and drive what's important to you. Uh, and then even just your personality, just like we as people, our brands have personalities that can sometimes be either be driven by a founder or just be driven by the personality that we want to attribute to the brand itself. So who you are, what you sell, uh, we'll sometimes look at that through the lens of a value proposition. So this is what I make. And sometimes it's not just about the thing, but it's about what you're trying to accomplish with that product. What value are you bringing into the marketplace with that product? What do you think it does well? Uh, and, and, and how is it going to be valued by the next subject down, the customer that you're trying to target? So who will buy your product 
and why will they buy it? And there's another really great, powerful framework, if you feel like Googling it, called the jobs to be done framework. And what we want to understand is not only who's going to be your, your best customer, like the, the core user of your product and who's going to advocate for you and love you, um, but what are they going to absolutely love about what you've created? What job are you helping them to accomplish? Is it serving a more nutritious dinner? Is it having a better snack in between meals? What job are you helping them to complete? And then positioning or how you'll stand out in the market. Um, we want to do and define the category that you're going to be in. We want to understand who are the competitors that are already there serving that need and that you'll be sort of putting your business or your brand in the middle of. And how much room do you have around yourself uh, by doing what you do differently? How much I sometimes I'll call it elbow room, like how much elbow room do you have around you? So we want to make sure that uh, through a broad strategy with it, we've identified your position in the market. And by focusing on those four tenets of a brand strategy, that begins to build out the plan for how you'll be successful. Uh, and well, one question I wanted to pose, uh, a lot of times these uh, titles, value propositions, positioning things, uh, add in the comments if you're familiar with what some of these terms mean or how they function within your business. Okay, next slide. So this is the, the broadest, simplest framework. We call it the three Cs. Uh, in working on a brand strategy, uh, the primary focus of a brand strategy is to take the information that you know ab about your business. And I've spoken to a lot of producers that can talk about their businesses forever. They can talk and provide all the details that you wanna ask, but oftentimes, you try to turn the conversation more towards understanding their brand and all of a sudden they become a little more stymied about how to talk about that versus their business. So this framework begins to um, provide the structure for converting all the knowledge they have about their business into how to talk about a brand. You can start to begin to understand more about your company and you can start to understand more about your competition and start to understand more about the consumer and as a collection of ideas, these all relate and it's allowing yourself to understand how these three elements of your business relate that allow you over time to make decisions easier, uh, allows you to make more consistent decisions over time because as your, as your business may change, as, as a customer may change, you ask, well, how does that affect my company and how does that affect the competitive environment that I'm in? So this begins to formulate the, the ecosystem that your brand exists in. And this is just the, the easiest framework that we can put together that allows you to start to categorize your thoughts and start thinking like a brand. Okay, next slide. So to take this a little bit further, um, I call this mining the gaps. So each of these overlaps have a real specific reason for being and beg to ask some additional questions. So as I've called out here, if we look at the overlap between your company and competition, obviously that's just understanding how are you different than the competition and how are you the same as the competition? Really understanding that relationship is key for, again, just understanding how you'll place yourself in the market successfully against the people that are already in there providing what you do. Uh, I'll go down to the bottom. If we think about the competition, uh, one key area to understand is how well is the cur current sort of body of competitors out there serving the customer that you wanna serve? Um, it's not always about understanding who is serving, uh, but it's understanding how well they're serving. And, and I make that distinction. Oftentimes with customers that I work with, they will frequently draw conclusions about what they need to do as a business or a brand by looking at products that are already on shelf. Um, but being on shelf doesn't necessarily mean that those competitors are performing well. Um, so to really understand how well is the competition serving the customer you're trying to serve is, is a, a, a critical piece of information to understand amongst others. And then probably the most under, uh, underserved and probably the biggest question that exists with most clients that I work with is questions about the consumer. Um, oftentimes it's just purely anecdotal information that they'll gather 
or they'll just see what other businesses are doing and, and make some assumptions on that. But really answering a lot of questions about how am I going to serve my customer? Who are they? Um, is, is typically the biggest arena to dive into to reap the best reward out of this framework for your business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Go ahead. So to get a little bit more granular, and, and again, the reason why I'm kind of starting from like broad and getting a little bit in more detail is for me, I feel like this literally can be a, a somewhat of a pragmatic process that you get into. You could literally grab a notebook and, and literally just start tabbing it out as company and competition and consumer and really start thinking of these very specific subsets of information within these three categories. And I broke it down into these. I was almost going to call it the three P's, but after we called it the three C's, I felt like that might be a little cheeky. <laughs> but when it comes to your company, um, who are the people that are driving it forward? What are the processes that you use to produce your product? Or what are the processes that you lean on to really drive good consumer experience? Uh, again, your personality and your products are critical. And really understanding how those elements compare to, again, the competition that's in the marketplace that you're going to be trying to perform in. Uh, it just gives you an ability to do an apples to apples comparison, which is just really, really critical to understand where you shouldn't go versus where there might be a better opportunity for you to go. And then when it comes to the consumer, again, just understanding who they are. And Becca can dive more into this and is the superstar there, but you've got demographic information, their age and where they live and if they're married or single or kids. Um, but then you've also got personality and attitudes and behaviors like psychographic information. Um, uh, how do they live? What are their attitudes towards sustainability or going organic or any, um, any questions like that? So these are just, again, subsets of company and competition and consumer that you can begin to start building out your own knowledge in. Um, and, and it's where brand strategy really starts to get its traction as just a really, really powerful way to plan for your business's success in the market. Move to the next slide. So just as, as a way to kind of demonstrate this before I go into the case study, um, you know, all of these elements, uh, because they are in relation to each other, they, they don't act independently. If there's an element that changes in one of these categories, um, it serves you to understand how that change may impact the other three components. So the demonstrate what I was going to talk through is so for example, if there's a, a change in a consumer trend, so people are behaving differently that you're accustomed to uh, dealing with and serving. Uh, you might say, well, I, I want to try to serve that new trend. Well, I want to look at the competition and let's see how the competition might already be serving that trend with their products. And once I do that, I'm going to look at my own company and say, well, with my processes and my products, can I change something here uh, that allows me to serve the consumer in a different way? So any change in one category begets other changes in the other two or may possibly change uh, how the other two relate. So it's always good to understand this as an ecosystem of, of ideas. Okay, next slide. And then just very quickly, I'm not going to dive into details here, but the one idea that I wanted to convey here is that brand strategy as a, as a plan can uh, be many times over in complexity to what this framework is. If you think about the type of brand strategy that a mom and a pop might need to start hitting farmers markets or to dive into local retailers versus the brand strategy that King Arthur Flower uses to rebrand, two vastly different programs, two vastly different budgets, two vastly different levels of detail. So it can kind of ebb and flow to meet different types of needs for different types of businesses. Okay, next. So this is just the, the case study. Um, what I would say is it's just, I won't really pause here to take any questions, but as we move forward, if there are specific things about what I went through about brand strategy that you wanna talk about, just submit your questions and we'll get to those in our Q and A. Okay, next slide. So this was Blake Hill Preserves. Um, this is a client that I worked with actually about 10 years ago. So it's been a while, but it's a really great example of how brand strategy can affect the brand. So when they first met with me, they had been in market for about two years, um, just had slower sales and slower growth than they had expected. Um, they found that they weren't really getting the types of traction and interest from grocers, even from local grocers where they thought their interest would be peaked. 
uh, the feedback was it's just a very crowded category. And when they came to me, their, their feeling was, well, packaging will resolve this. We need new packaging. So go to the next page. Uh, so when we dove into, again, analyzing their company, analyzing the competition and analyzing the customer as part of their brand strategy, which is what we'll do with any design project, um, where they had launched is they felt like, well, let's look at the, comp com the, let's look at the competition out there and let's meet them where they are. Let's try to make a better strawberry jam or a better raspberry jam. So they literally went head to head. Uh, they had felt that handmade was a really great call out for this product just purely by looking around them and looking at the industry, they felt that that would have traction. And they were really kind of going for that quaint small business from Grafton, Vermont. That was essentially the platform that they launched and went into market with. Okay, next slide. But what we found when we dug in was some really, really compelling uh, sort of changes to their strategy. Uh, Blake Hill Preserves is run by Vicky and Joe, a husband and wife. Vicky uh, is a third generation preserve maker from England, and Joe is a trained chef of a family of trained chefs from Morocco. So he's got really good flavor profiles and command of spices. Uh, within the competitive landscape, there was an opportunity to create more high end flavor varieties than what currently existed. And that was uh, confirmed by doing some consumer research and even some research with retailers as far as what they felt would be a, a better value added product to their shelves. Okay. And how that all migrated. So I'll, I'll always consider design to be a bit of a souvenir of the strategy process. Um, but ultimately it led to a design that helped them elevate their offering and go back and say, look, we have something different than what we had before. And even to this day, the effect of that brand strategy still holds. This is a, a, a passage from their current website. And as opposed to a quaint marmalade maker from Grafton, Vermont, they are now an English fruit preservatory in Vermont. And they lead with the idea of combining three generations of preserve making with skills and innovative, super elegant flavors. So you can see how, where they thought their messaging was right when they launched, they realized it's not working. How do we affect this? And brand strategy came along and really dug in and figured out, you know, with the market, the way that it is and what you have available to you from a company and a competitive and a consumer landscape, if we can realign these ideas and resurface in this way, you've got an ability to be much more successful. And they are tremendously successful to this day, uh, just with an extensive product line and, uh, and they've never looked back. So that's the power of, of brand strategy in terms of really just coming up with the right message to get out there for your brand. And that is a wrap for me. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Mm. Such a good example. I love that. Um, and uh, as you were talking, I realized I didn't exactly explain um, why we decided to do this together. And I thought that before I get started into this section, I wanted to just let everybody know that Steve and I have had the pleasure and fun experience of uh, working on several client projects together, where he brings his brand strategy framework and I zoom into the sort of consumer circle um, to see what we find. And then we put, put it all together and help answer, you know, whatever the client's question is. So we've had some great real world experience uh, along the way. And let's see, Rhonda has a question for Steve quickly. Um, She's wondering if you have ever done a brand strategy for a client and then the client does the execution. You want to tackle that quickly, Steve? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I definitely have. Um, there have been instances where people come to me with packaging already done and uh, they realize that they still don't feel quite equipped to kind of move forward, um, that the, the packaging didn't resolve kind of that lingering idea or question about how to be successful. Uh, and so I have done just strategy only projects and then allowed them to kind of connect with another talent of, of whoever they choose to, to execute for sure. Yeah, that's great. And I, I have a similar approach where you know, I like to say, if, if I'm doing my job well, eventually I will sort of work myself out of a job and be able to, to hand everything off to the clients to execute with their team. 
That's usually the goal with these types of projects. Um, so diving into the customer side of brand strategy, um, I wanted to you know, spend some time thinking about what's really unique about the food industry. And so we're gonna go through those thoughts as well as some techniques you can use. So back to the th three C's framework, just to reorient ourselves, I'm really going to be zooming in on this one little section here um, where the dot is. And you know, it's, it might look like a small section of this chart, but it, there's so much in there and it's so important. And I have worked in, you know, I have an MBA and I've worked with so many different business models and seen so many different marketing techniques. And the reason why I focus on customer insights now instead of another piece of marketing is because I just truly believe it's the most powerful lever that you can pull when you look at all of this together. Um, so we'll be looking at, you know, how you can make sure you are actually overlapping with what your customer wants. And I always like to share this Henry Ford quote, you know, he likes to say, he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this sort of encompasses what I hear a lot from entrepreneurs and, and creative folks, whether it's in the food industry or any industry, um, you know, people tend to worry that it's really their job to come up with all the ideas and they don't necessarily want to go out to the consumer to see what they think because they feel like, well, I'm the innovator. I'm supposed to come to the table with the solutions here. So I'm curious if anyone here kind of has that mentality at all, or if you've ever grappled with that. Um, and of course, you know, the answer is Absolutely, you all are the innovators and it is your job to come up with a solution that nobody has found yet or the, you know, the new jam flavor that doesn't exist today. And that is part of what drives all of us and why we do what we do. But I've noticed a tendency to kind of take that too far. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you ignore what your customer wants or, you know, doesn't mean that their needs are invalid. It just means that, you know, yes, you're in the driver's seat, but the consumer insights are an important sort of uh, ingredient that goes into your thinking and you'll have more likelihood of success if you take that into account. So something I think is really unique about food and maybe this sounds obvious, but in the world of consumer behavior, it presents an incredible opportunity um, is that people really, they eat more often than they do just about anything else. I mean, I was trying to think of examples and maybe like, how, you know, they're probably picking up their iPhone more <laughs> than they're eating, um, but almost any other habit. So this really creates a lot of opportunities to reach them. You know, you have so eating three times a day, eating multiple ingredients, multiple food types. Um, you have all these opportunities to kind of get in there and make your voice heard, but it also comes with challenges. You know, because folks are eating so often, they we all have you know pretty ingrained habits about around food because you know otherwise we would all just you know our heads would explode from all of the inputs and um, it would be really overwhelming. So that's kind of a challenge to that we all have to break through. So you know, where can you find those insights that will strengthen your brand strategy? That's where we're going to go next. Um, I'm going to talk about three ways you can harness your consumer insights to help you drive growth and strengthen your brand strategy. So the first step is, it sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how many people do not take the time to get this done. So the first step is to really define your audience and know who you're talking to. And spoiler alert, it's, the answer is not everyone. The answer is, cannot be, my brand is for everyone. That is not going to help you, even if you, you know, there, and it's a difference. There, there's a subtlety there between, you know, being a welcoming and inclusive brand. Any brand can be that, but, uh, you know, just um, orienting your strategy towards everyone is just um, not the right way to go. So there are a lot of ways you can approach getting to know your audience um, and I've kind of laid them out according to a business's stage because there's different techniques and investment levels that will best fit where you are. So if you're just starting out, a great way to approach this is, you know, what Steve was talking about earlier, getting out a notebook or, you know, there's millions of 
sort of ideal customer avatar worksheets that you can get out there, um, but kind of creating a profile on pen and paper of who you think your ideal customer is. And it's totally fine to start with a hypothesis. And um, you know that gives you some focus and some clarity and direction when you're doing things like designing your website um, and putting together your entire brand strategy. You wanna think, you know, who is this for? And it, it usually should not be for you because you, you know, taking the jam maker example, you are a jam fanatic and you know everything about jam and you live and breathe it. Your customer does not, you know, you're trying to figure out your way onto their plate, maybe for one breakfast a week, or, you know, um, and we'll talk about use cases in a second. So that works if you're just starting out. If you already have proof of concept and you've been growing for about one to three years, um, surveys and one-on-one -on -one interviews with customers are a great way to build a customer profile that's actually based on real data. Because while you know the hypothesis is awesome to start with, you are definitely baking in assumptions that are not gonna necessarily be accurate into your thinking. And so once you have kind of that group of customers that's large enough to um, actually talk to and hear what they think, it's important to take that step. And uh, I just love this part of the work that we do with our clients because um, the surprises that come out of, of, of taking this step are always just incredible. And then if you're a well-established business, you know, customer uh, focus approach to marketing should really be baked into that marketing infrastructure. We have clients where we're sending out a monthly survey, or there are also tech tools you can use to send out surveys sort of um, in real time, depending on uh, your sales process and, um, you know, doing different kind of deep dives once a quarter, depending on the, um, the campaigns you have going. So at that point, you know, we recommend uh, really having it embedded into your business, but you have to obviously work up to that. So the second way that you can really incorporate um, the way customers are thinking about your product into your business plan and your brand strategy is uh, by finding the eating opportunities. And so, you know, a lot of times we'll call these use cases. I recommend you pick three to five uh, ways that eaters are consuming your product and that's it. Just focus on those for the whole year. Um, and the, the reasoning here is that, you know, of course people can make up different ways to eat your product outside of that but it just gives a real sense of focus and clarity for you. And it allows you to um, you know, get feedback on what's working and what's not. And um, probably one will come to the surface and I'll go through an example in a minute. But again, this is a great opportunity for brainstorming with your notebook. Um, I like to think, you know, there's people eat for millions of reasons, uh, but you can think about, you know, are they eating this product for an emotional reason, maybe nostalgia, or is it functional? Is it all about like, you know, capturing protein after a workout? Is it an everyday food or is it a special treat? Is it something folks enjoy solo or is it a social type of item? Um, is it healthy or is it an indulgent? Um, and I had actually a different case study from a project that Steve and I worked on, but um, I don't know if Alex from Nomadic Kitchen is here, but sometimes I like to mix it up and actually use one of our attendees as a case study. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and you know, thinking about finding use cases for a super niche product. So Nomadic Kitchen makes artisanal marshmallows, which is um, very niche, right? And it's a great example of um, a creative food entrepreneur putting their own spin on something that's kind of a classic. So yeah, marshmallows are delicious and nostalgic, but they're not in most folks, most people's eating routines on a daily basis. So thinking about potential use cases is going to be really key. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Alex's product, but I have to admit, I, they tend to sit in my cupboard because I'm not just, I'm just not in the habit of eating marshmallows regularly. And I think if Nomadic Kitchen gave me some ways and some ideas on how I could eat marshmallows more often, it would really work well for me. So a few things that um, I've seen uh, them share about that she could really focus on and uh, kind of 
bring to life even more are, you know, adding your marshmallow to a coffee, a cup of coffee for a little hint of sweetness and creaminess. Um, also, a lot of folks just like to eat marshmallows like as a snack, a naked marshmallow, right? Um, and so I think for me, that would help me wrap my head around how I can use this product more in my everyday life beyond what I do right now, which is just add it to my kids, you know, and my hot chocolate when we drink hot chocolate, but which is, you know, maybe like once or twice a month in the winter. So that would help me think of more ways to eat more marshmallows, which then, um, you know, Alex's business is booming, but that would help reach even more people. So I'm curious, anyone here uh, need help thinking about use cases? Because one thing we could do either now or later on in the Q&A uh, is to brainstorm these and uh, help get those ideas going. So feel free to share that in the chat. Sass has another idea for marshmallows. Yeah, camping treat. I like that. And that's the, that's another place where it's natural already for people to think of marshmallows, you know, when they're making s'mores. Um, and, and so, you know, definitely pack these along. Awesome. So number three, the third way you can build um, sort of a, con a consumer oriented way of thinking into your brand strategy is to, um, and also this helps with overcoming that challenge that, you know, while people are eating all the time, you have to really break through and be able to catch their attention because their habits are pretty strong. So a lot of food companies can succeed at that by introducing new items. It doesn't have to be a whole new line of products. Um, again, with the Blake Hill example, a new flavor is a really you know, I'm not going to say it's easy because obviously the operations of any food company are going to be complicated um, and unique to that company, but a relatively simple way, uh, a new flavor is a great example. And so I just wanted to share a lot of the large, larger CPG brands that we've worked with. Um, they, this is a metric that they really closely follow. And so, um, you know, and some Companies have entire departments that are devoted to new product development, and you'll hear, you know, what's the NPD team working on these days? Um, and they aim for 10% of annual sales to be driven by new product launches. And the reason that they do that is um, that it works. This is how they catch people's attention. Uh, and then, you know, like let's say your Doritos. If I'm going to introduce Cool Ranch Doritos and that catches somebody's eye, then, you know, once they're hooked on that, I have a way to introduce them to the rest of my products and hopefully sell in a few more. So let's see. I have some comments coming in here. Oh, thank you, Emily, for sharing your info. Awesome. Great. So is anyone... Um, launching a new product soon or just launched one we'd love to hear about that in the chat as well and sass is sharing that in her distillery company merch was a lot of revenue over time yeah that is a great example of how to add a new product line um and one example i'm going to talk about next is um how you know you want, sometimes need to think outside the box at adjacent products like merchandise is a great example. Um, but, you know, along with food, go a lot of other products, right? There's candles to decorate the table and linens. And so you can get creative with collaborations or, you know, following other passions for yourself. Um, so that's a great point. One thing I was just going to say. Oh, go ahead. The one thing I was going to say real quick is you know, there there's a lot of things that when you, when you look at the environment around you, what other brands are doing, I think that the key is always, and again, this is why brand strategy can really sort of cloak your ideas is uh, I see what other people are doing. Uh, I like that idea. H how do we put our stamp on it? Like, how do we do it differently so that it, it really still feels like another piece of swag, but it's so clearly from us, so clearly identifiable. And it's uh, when you under have that understanding and that filter you can process, then it makes those decisions even easier. Like, how do we, what's the right swag for us? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, is it going to be a baby onesie or is it going to be a beanie? Like, those are very different decisions. 
Um, and so uh, All Phenoms is saying they just launched a functional sparkling water with real organic fruit and nutrition. That's so exciting. Definitely going to check that out. And then Luke says he just launched his company District Snacks last month, starting with chocolate chip cookie dough almond butter with two new flavors coming out in May. That sounds amazing. I can't yes, wait please. to learn more about that. <laughs> and so building on what Steve was just saying, you know, when you say, okay, I want to launch something new and then, you know, you got to um, figure out what the heck you're going to launch. Right. And so this is where a customer driven approach can really set you apart. You know, I, I meet a lot of clients and they're kind of taking that mad scientist approach and just creating whatever. And, um, you know, of course that's part of the fun of working in food, that creative you know, uh, experimental piece. And I'm not saying to squash that, but when you, when you take the time to get consumer insights ahead of your brainstorming process, it just makes sure you're on the right track. You know, throwing spaghetti at the wall, it gets old fast, it's really expensive, and it's just a better approach, better use of your time, your resources, your investment, if you have direction from the get-go. And so this case study is a really great example of that. Um, this is uh, a client I worked with a couple of years ago called Wellness Mama. She was a blogger turned maker. She knew she wanted to launch a line of products and was really excited about it. She had recently published a cookbook. You know, she had a lot of different kinds of content, but her cooking and recipe content was really near and dear to her heart. So she was really considering everything from like toothpaste to pots and pans to, um, you know, uh, pillows and uh, glasses and even more. Um, and she really insisted that there were no patterns to her content. Um, and she also had a, a particular idea about who her audience was. She thought it was mostly stay at home moms. It turned out that was inaccurate. We looked at the data and we helped her identify what people really wanted from her, which turned out to be nothing to do with food necessarily, but um, her skin, uh, dental care, and hair care content was actually the most high performing and highly visited pages on her website. Uh, we also learned that that assumption about her audience was incorrect, was really interesting. We did a series of um, in-person one-on-one interview, not sorry, uh, on Zoom, interviews on Zoom. And we put the, you know, we're like, okay, stay-at-home moms, we're gonna offer them time slots during the, you know, nine to five. And we couldn't book any. And we said, oh, okay, we're gonna have to open up this, you know, include some evening hours. And it turned out that most of her audience was not a stay-at-home mom, they were a working mom who just had an affinity for wellness. And so that was a really key assumption that we proved false. We discovered those patterns and she was able to launch a successful line of toothpaste and hair care. And so you know, I talk about this example all the time and you just imagine if she had launched pots and pans instead, they'd just be sitting on the shelf gathering dust. And so this is such a great example of why it's so key to take that step before you launch into something new. Awesome. Okay. So just wanted to come back to this framework one last time. I hope you can see, you know, how these circles are overlapping and how you can, as a business owner or um, a professional in the food industry, start thinking about how to get into this little slice here and how to get away from you know, thinking of your company the way you think about it every day and start putting yourself in your customer's shoes and gathering those insights. Let's see, any question? So, okay, Matthew has a great question. Was it just through analyzing her blog or were there other studies that found out? So this was a big project. We did a survey to her audience and a series of interviews with about 15 folks. And that's where um, we found the, um, the demographic profile of the audience. But what we found um, just looking at your top 10 performing web pages is a really great place to start. If you don't have a large enough audience to run a full survey or a series of interviews and focus groups, because that um, you'll often find surprises in your, your top most visited or top most clicked um, content on your website. 
and Rory's wondering if I have any favorite platforms or tools for customer surveys. Uh, I love SurveyMonkey and Google Forms. Google Forms is great because it's free. You do definitely lose a bit on the um, analytics side. It's, it's a little clunkier to work with. And SurveyMonkey is easy and um, uh, easy to use for the, the participant and also on the anal analysis side. Uh, but I've also been playing around with Typeform as well, because I like the user interface for that a lot. So we might be moving to that. Hey, Becca, I've, I've um, been made aware of another platform called uh, uh, Ask Your Target Market. It's AYTM.com. Have you ever heard of that? And if you have any, any insights about how that compares to the platforms you use? I've heard of it, but I haven't used it yet. So, you know, there are definitely great tools um, to, to check out. I would say if you're, if you're just getting started, um, keep it simple and uh, don't spend too much money because there are a lot of great free tools to, to get started with. Um, also, I recommend working with an expert because it does take a lot of effort to uh, put a survey together and then field it and then analyze it. And you don't wanna lose out if you're, even if you're just investing the time to write your survey, you wanna make sure you get the most out of it that you can. Um, and so before we go into our Q&A, you know, uh, as promised, this is a pitch-free webinar, but Steve and I would be remiss if we didn't at least share with you, you know, if anyone would like to work with us, we're certainly open to talking about that. And um, we have a few options that we, we uh, and formats that work really well for our client engagements. Uh, we do incentive sessions, which is like a 90 minute um, session to help workshop an idea and get feedback on a shorter problem or project. We have a great audit and insights package where we, um, Steve takes a look at your brand and does an audit there. And then I uh, run a survey to your audience to get your current customer profile and we feed all of that back into whatever your goals may be, if you have a launch coming up or just generally trying to improve your sales. Um, and you can see the prices associated there. And then we also do custom projects, um, like I talked about that Wellness Mama project was a big custom project we ran. Uh, and that can help you figure out your overall brand strategy and design. This is great for a new brand um, that maybe has some investment behind it or finding your ideal target customer profile on a deeper level. If you wanna do something like a focus group or a, a series of interviews or shop alongs, launch preparation, and um, also lead if you're working on product innovation like we were talking about before. So those typically are um, starting at 10,000. And we wanted to let everyone know that if you uh, book a call, Dave th just uh, put the link in here. If you book a call with us by next Wednesday, you're up for getting 20% uh, off any of these services. So again, zero pressure, wanted to provide that information. And um, now we will get right into the Q&A. And yes, Sass, we, I see you appreciate the transparency on pricing. Uh, we feel the same way, you know, it's like, I don't want anyone to waste 30 minutes of their time booking a call if they don't have the budget or if they're gonna be, um, you know, com completely surprised by the cost behind it. So that's why we like to share that with you right up front and it will be in the recording as well. So definitely go ahead and book that call. And uh, you, the call doesn't have to take place by what next Wednesday, it just has to be on the calendar and you'll get a little email reminder for that. So now we're gonna open it up for the Q&A and, um, Rory submitted a great question ahead of time that I wanted to start us out with. And his question was, you know, how do you build a good marketing structure and system without burning out? You know, because he's worked in a, a few startups and, um, you know, we to we've heard a lot of clients say that they're just overwhelmed by everything that they could dive into. So how do you kind of structure your team? and? Uh, I'll give my answer and let Steve chime in as well. But um, I think the first thing is having a clear plan and strategy can just help you focus on the right things, right, at the right time. And so, you know, you, there's always going to be bright, shiny objects, you know, 
trying to vie for your attention. But if you can work with the leadership team to establish some clear goals and plans and just be ruthless with adding anything new to your list, right? We have to you know, say that sounds like an exciting opportunity, but it's not in our plan for this quarter or this year. We're going to have to get to it next. And when you have a really robust strategy and the insights behind it that you can rely on and you can really trust, it becomes a lot easier to make those decisions and to say no to the wrong things so that you can make space to say yes to the right things. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, you just can't understaff your marketing team. And um, you know sometimes if a lot of people are um, experiencing burnout, it, it's time to invest in, in more staff power, which I, I realize is, is easier said than done, but um, something that I think is not spoken up enough out there. Steve, what do you think? Any tips to um, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm going to sort of sort of maybe take a little bit of a guess and extrapolate extrapolate what Rory might have been asking in terms of the brand strategy part that I've been talking about. But um, I guess what I would say is this, you know, um, brand strategy seems like a very tall order of something to try to just dive into all at once and figure out. And it's a lot of moving parts and a lot of glue that needs to kind of bring all those things together. Um, one thing that Beck and I have talked about in the past is, you know, there are a lot of elements that make up a brand strategy. And oftentimes you can just look at where do you feel you as a brand or as a business are maybe weak or being underserved in your knowledge about your business. So it's, I, I don't want to call it specifically like spot treating an issue, but, but that's not far from how you can think of it. Um, I've worked with businesses that really just want to foco, focus on what I call the heart of your brand, which is let's just get into that internal component of, of who you are our values and our mission and our vision and our purpose. Um, and the other part is just in terms of thinking about how would I step into this process and this, this service, how could it work with my business? Uh, a lot of it just depends on what you want to get out of your business. What kind of performance do you want to get out of it? Um, I'll sometimes use an analogy to a car. Um, if, if you're looking to race at NASCAR, but you're only putting in a thousand dollars into the engine, it's, it's not going to work. So I'll always say, spend as much as you can afford, but also an amount that is commensurate with what you feel you stand to gain out of the work. Um, and that's just in a way to, to kind of approach it and, and size the, the initiative to your business. Um, and, and then in working with somebody like Becca and I, we can also talk about whether or not your hopes for the return are just not congruent with what you're looking to invest. That's why we're here to kind of help guide the process into your business and, and, and bring you into it. That's great. Thank you. Um, Kelly has a great question about uh, what do we think of the effectiveness of focus groups in the modern marketing environment? I love that question. I have a lot of opinions on that. Um, I'm, I may be biased, but a um, little bit of a backstory. I actually took a survey writing and um, in uh, focus group preparation class, or actually, no, I didn't take the class. I TA'd for a class um, all about that in business school. And I was like, this is the most boring thing <laughs> that I have ever seen. And now I do it for a living. So I can really appreciate the skepticism that's out there. You know, we have so much data at our fingertips um, on a mass scale that a lot of clients um, do come to us and say, okay, I'm gonna to talk to 10 people. How do I know that it's the right 10 people? How can I trust what they're telling me? And um, you know, it's just the proof is in the pudding. The experience of spending you know, half an hour to a 45 minutes with either one human being or um, a group of individuals or, or in a, a focus group setting, it, it's, you know, I think maybe, I, I could describe it as life-changing. Um, just hearing people talk about how they use your products or other products in their industries, hearing them describe what their lives are like, it just really roots you in this sense of reality that, um, you know, when we're talking about focus groups, even surveys, um, and I, I'm really proud of our survey approach, but a survey can't touch a, a in-person conversation. And um, the, the insights that come out of, it, out of it are just incredible, like Steve, heard, um, we ran a focus group in the um, drinkable goat's milk category. And this woman was talking about plant-based milk and she said, you know, well, I think that 
it must be good because there's a lot of it on the shelf at the grocery store. And, you know, Steve and I are here banging our heads against the wall, trying to find the right word. And just that one little thing, seeing more bottles and more options was sending her this message that, you know, we couldn't really do anything about, but was so important for us to know as, as background information. So um, Kelly, that's a bit of a long winded way of, of saying, I think they're extremely effective uh, and they're an often overlooked piece of the modern marketing puzzle. And I think that that's too bad. Um, and uh, I'll also say, I think that the modern marketing tools are really exciting. And so, you know, you have to have a holistic approach. So thank you. Let's see any, um, SAS also asked about the size of marketing budgets for companies. Um, so we'll answer that too. Uh, this, like Steve was saying, you have to spend as much as you can <laughs> and as much as you can afford. But just to give you a snippet into how large companies typically work with that, um, the bigger CPG brands I've worked with typically designate around just anywhere between two to 5% of annual revenue to the marketing budget. So if I'm a giant company making $100 million in annual sales, my marketing budget will be two to $5 million. And so that's, you know, for smaller businesses starting out, just a good sort of metric as, how, you know, if you're making 100,000 a year, maybe you're dedicating two to 5,000 for your marketing budget. Um, and then you can also take the reverse, look at, you know, what are the marketing investments I really want to make? And then, um, you know, just build that into your budget planning process. Awesome. Anyone else, Steve, anything to add? Any frequent questions you usually get from clients or food business owners? Yeah, no, I, I really, uh, it, oftentimes it is, how do I spend? It, it, it can be kind of nerve wracking because it, it appears as though it's a, it's um, like a, a secret weapon. I mean, but sometimes that is how I look at it, brand strategy. It, um, there's a lot of creativity in running a business, but at some point you can boil it down to just data and facts and this process is about converting as many assumptions that exist based on anecdotal evidence, converting as many of those into facts as you can. I think that's why I really appreciate what you do, Becca, and, and, and why I, I love the brand strategy part is that it kind of removes some of the creativity out of it. Um, but to find those answers just takes work and work generally means a budget and spending. And that, but that's almost always what people want to know right out of the gate is just like, well, how much is this going to cost? And oftentimes my answer is, well, how much is the solution worth to you? I mean, how, how valuable is finding these answers? Because it's not a one and done, it, it sets a line moving forward and, but brand strategy evolves over time. So it, the, the longer they're, the longer that they've taken the dive and learned brand strategy, the more they themselves begin to learn it. And it just has dividends moving forward forever, as long as they keep on considering it and growing with that strategy in mind. So it's, it amortizes well. Yeah. Yeah. And something I always tell or I'll often tell folks, depending on the project scope, is that it's um, and it's always my goal and something that uh, almost always happens is that my goal is to pay for myself as a consultant with the results of the project. Right. So if we're look, figuring out your ideal target consumer, I want you to be able to, you know, tweak your email stra marketing strategy and sell more to that consumer and then, you know, pay for for our project together and get that ROI. And a lot of times, even if you don't, aren't in the habit of sending surveys, um, I have literally seen one survey uh, combined with an incentive to purchase. So like, hey, take this survey, get five bucks off your next purchase. That alone has paid for my consulting fee, just one, one survey. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways you can make money using this work. And uh, one thing I think is really fun is, is helping clients identify those all along the way. They can be big and they can be small. Um, so let's see, um, Aaron is asking the difference between consumer and customer. I actually really hate both of those words, even though I say them all the time. I like to think of them as people. <laughs> and um, in the world of CPG, customer means like the like if I'm um, let's I'll use Applegate as an example. So a long-standing client I used to work there. Um, you know, the the customer is like the public's grocery store that's buying the case of the hot dogs, and the consumer is the person eating it. So typically consumer is 
the end user who's actually, you know, like putting your product in their body or on their body or in their house or whatever. Um, and the customer could sometimes refer to um, like a more of a B2B entity. Let's see, Steve, do you want to take um, this question about, um, I'm going to read the question because anyone with the recording is not able to read the chat. So um, we have two questions here. What are your marketing views or opinions on second generation businesses that change with the takeover from the next generation? I know why you're asking that because it's your business. Um, yeah. It's Arthur's fault. And then secondly, how ideal is it to be brutally honest with your super loyal and invested customer base? Um, so why don't you take the first question, Steve, and I'll take yeah, this. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I've been involved um, with a local business that actually went through that generational shift. And uh, it, it really comes down to, again, if we go back to the, the framework, it's like, well, it's, it's a change in your company. And if there's a change in your company, you've got to ask, well, how will this change impact our customers? And within the competitive environment, like how does this change affect that? And so when I work with them, it, you know, th that framework is, is pretty robust. I got more granular for sure. Um, but when there's a shift, you've just got to kind of understand that there's a, a timing element to it. So this shift was going to happen over time. So we understood, okay, well, we have some time to kind of migrate this shifting idea with your customers. Along with that shift was going to be, again, getting back to the, the company, was going to be a shift in their product, meaning that the new ownership wanted to essentially start to diminish the sales of an existing product line and launch into some new territories. So you can begin to see how with that brand strategy in mind, all of a sudden these relationships start getting pushed and pulled and stretched in ways that they had to reconcile. They couldn't just dump a product line that was already very popular with a current consumer base. Uh, so they had to figure out how they migrate that slowly. And, and at some point it, it gets a little, you know, you're, you're essentially trying to appease two different groups at one time but they had the people there to do it. It was gonna be a slower migration. Um, and so you, you've just got to account for what that transition is gonna look like. Um, and with the original owners gone, you, they may have to accept that some people might just say that they were why we were here. So you might lose some customers when that happens. Some of the products are gonna go away. Again, we may lose some of our customers once those products go away, but it, it, everything is about a plan. So they just planned how long they would take to do it and how they would need to try as, as much as possible to usher in and keep as many current customers as possible, even though the transition was happening. Um, and again, when you, when you really understand this ecosystem of how everything affects everything else, it really does give you this idea of and way to just understand an action and a reaction and then a reaction to that and so it's a, it's a really tight system to, to, to do exactly what you just outlined. It's, that's, what, that's why this is here, is to help those types of moments. Right, yeah, because every business is going, you know, whether it's a generational shift or changing hands or you know, whatever other you know, new pandemic comes down the path, um, having these frameworks to rely on when you face difficult challenges uh, allows you to be more confident, in confident and fast in navigating them. And so your, your second question on how, is, is it okay to be brutally honest with your super loyal invested customer base? I think to answer that properly, I probably need to know more about your customer base. Um, I think you know, having, having a strong point of view is always a good thing. And so if, if you have a reason for that brutal, on, uh, brutal honesty that, is rooted in your point of view and is going to be really relevant to them. I think that's fine. Um, I would say, you know, it's it, it's often um, a, a great and eye-catching strategy. You know, I worked with a client once where they were um, in a really difficult financial position, and they put they had to send an email out and said, "Hey, if you guys don't help us grow, we're going to close." And so it was kind of like this ultimatum and that's not a strategy that I would normally recommend. <laughs> it wasn't something that they took lightly, but it worked, you know, it caught people's attention and it, and it reminded them that, you know, this was a company that was sort of on the quieter side and they took that loud approach and it, it really caught people's attention. Um, so that can work 
quite well if if used well at the right time and not too often, I guess I would say. I hope that helps answer your question. And then let's see, Matthew had a great question here on how important is innovative language in defining your brand or do you stop, find that standard buzzwords like organic, artisanal are sufficient to catch in customers' eyes? Um, and this is a topic that we dive into in detail with um, our survey work. And so we are always asking folks about, you know, things like we call them claims, like a lot of those buzzwords that you would see on a pack, piece of packaging, um, because knowing whether to put something on the front of your packaging or the back, I know Tali and Amy are here from Wild Good. We've done a lot of that work together too. Um, it's really critical to know what's going to catch people's eyes. And you know, when it comes to your brand, you're probably going to have your a few unique words that are unique to your company and a few that are sort of industry wide words that are important to catch eyes, um, you know, when you're against the competition. Steve, what do you think about that? Obviously, packaging design, I think I set yeah. you up well for that, is, uh, is a key right. piece of the as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different um, optics on that subject. Um, I, I was just in a, a client meeting recently and they had done some survey work and realized that when it came to their product category, all natural was still a very relevant claim to make on their product. In some other categories and, and even you know maybe by the FDA standards, something like all natural actually doesn't really mean a thing you know, if you really get down and define it. Same thing with artisanal or small batch. Or, there's some claims that came on the scene that really meant something specific, but then you know, larger corporations started to come along and started to call their products artisanal or small batch and everything got kind of cloudy and murky. And then, you know, all of a sudden it just started to remain meaningless. But I think to, to Becca's point, it's, it's really important to test those things out because again, I don't, I don't know that all natural would have even dawned on me as a still highly relevant claim, but I think it depends on the, the consumer. It depends on the product that it's being attached to. Um, but when you, when you start formulating the, the bivy of claims that you think you might want to make, uh, test them and, you know, make sure they're authentic, make sure they really do mean what they're supposed to mean. Artisanal has now become more defined in terms of what that really means. Uh, so you've just got to test and then just really make sure that you're being authentic and realistic and, and true to what they're supposed to mean and not, not misleading in any way. That, 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 that'll be the other component is that there should never, even if you're not intending to do those, if the claim can more often than not mislead a consumer, then then there's and then it's problematic. Yeah, yeah. I think that question is really also a great reminder that you know your your brand needs to go beyond buzzwords, right? Um, and and that's the value of having a great brand is that you're creating this this more three dimensional picture and emotional resonance with your customer. So that things like, you know, I mean, things like packaging claims will always be important, but it's not going to be sort of like at the primary level, you'll have a deeper connection uh, with your customer if you have a solid brand strategy. So great. Awesome. All right. Well, we are 10 minutes over. Guys, this is a very lively Q&A. We'd love to see that. Uh, but we're going to wrap up now and um, be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you all so much for coming. This was a really fun session that went really fast. And um, you'll get the replay from us in an email. Um, uh, and um, so look out for that. And we are here for you. And please don't hesitate to reach out anytime you want on Instagram. Steve and I are both active in the DMs as well as email. I think you have all of our information. And Steve, I want to thank you for joining me today. This was a really fun session and I'm excited to continue our work together. Yeah, thank you, Becca, for the opportunity and just to, uh, to mirror Becca's comments, really thank you everybody for committing a good part of your afternoon and maybe even your lunch hour to us and uh, appreciate the community we're able to pull together even as short as it was. So thanks for your time and, and, uh, and interest. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. With that, we'll say goodbye. <laughs>